Connected with our new book, Where the Red Fern Grows. And um, be a good listener if you don't already have it with you. These chapters are long. Almost all of these chapters are going to take me at least a half hour to read, if not more. Um, so that's why it's important that you guys are going to want the copy because when you do your questions and whatever, you're probably going to want to be able to like look back. Okay. So for today, we're going to go over all the questions together since some of you aren't going to have your book to look back at, but going forward, please make sure you have the book. So please, it's a beautiful day outside. Have your parents run up here and return hatchet and pick up where the red fern grows. It's sitting in the little breezeway up there for you guys. Okay. Um, all right, so before we actually start the book, um, on the worksheet that you have for today, and Zeke, do you have that worksheet? Did it pop up in your seesaw, hit refresh? It should have hit at exactly eight. What worksheet? Oh, do I have the Baptist region? Yeah, I responded to your email, yo. Look up in the top left of your seesaw where you can change to specials classes or ECP or whatever. And there should be one that says Babs Blue Jays at home. Oh, wait. If there's not, you just need to hit refresh because I put you in it. Okay, I have it. Yeah, it's good. Okay. So, yeah, if you go to that and then you, it should be in your activities, it should say Red Fern Chapter 1. Do you have that in there? You do? Yes? Yes. Okay. All right. So this book, the type of book that this is, is autobiographical fiction. So normally when we hear autobiography, we think it's, it's bio, it's life. Okay. And an autobiography means somebody's writing about themselves. So we think nonfiction, but this is autobiographical fiction. Sam is like screwing his nose up like this. Uh, so what do you think that might mean? Autobiographical fiction. Josie, what do you think? Uh, the first thing that came to my mind was like something about where you write it yourself or someone writes it about you, but it's about your experience, not about you. And they just the reason that it's fiction is like they just change a few things maybe you're pretty much spot on joe's um so what autobiographical fiction is is it's exactly that autobiography means somebody's writing about themselves but it is a fiction story not everything in the story is 100 percent accurate so some of the events are kind of true but not everything in the book. Sean. So it's kind of like so you're writing about yourself in a book, and if it's fictional, you like you have like a laser eyes. You have what? Laser eyes? Yeah. Okay. So Sean said he wants to write a book about himself, and he's going to make everything like like it is. He's a student. He's a fifth grader at Telegraph. Yeah, then I'm going to fight crime and talk. And but he's got laser eyes, and he can fight crime. It's definitely fiction now. Um, awesome. Okay. Awesome. But um, yeah, so this one's going to be a little bit more real realistic than laser eyed Sean. Uh, but it is going to be loosely based on our author's life. So the author of this book is a gentleman named Wilson Rawls. And like the main character in this book, Wilson Rawls, used events from his personal life as the foundation for the book, okay? His main character is a boy named Billy. That's my dad. Billy, Billy. Billy in this book is based off of Wilson Rawls' childhood, okay? Both Wilson Rawls, our author, and Billy, our main character, are little boys growing up in the Ozark Mountains of Oklahoma on a farm and they were both very, very poor, okay? So in real life, our author, Wilson Rawls, grew up a poor boy on a farm in the Ozark Mountains of Oklahoma. Our main character, Billy, also has that same situation, okay? Now, I don't think he's a poor little boy anymore because he wrote one of the most famous novels of ever. Yeah, now he got 15. So, but, 
really then this shows that it doesn't matter where you come from right you can overcome it right you can be anything you want um so but keep that in mind that everything that happens in this story is somehow kind of based on what happened with wilson rawls and i want you guys to think about that and think about what kind of things do you think are actually accurate as we're reading this story and what do you think might be something he kind of fibbed on and made it a little more interesting? I got a question. Okay. Because if you were to write a story about your everyday life, most days would be a pretty boring story, right? Sam's like, no, man, my story is epic every day. He's like looking at me like, Miss Babb, have you met me? Um, I am still. Okay. So the, the title of this, every time you say it, reminds me of the song where the green grass grows. Where the green grass grows? Well, where the red fern grows is our book, Josie. Um, so, actually, it kind of reminds me of my grandparents, like my grandpa that um, is really old and that caught on fire and stuff. Uh, so, um, whenever he told me stories about whenever he was younger, and he was like, they had to walk, like, a lot, like, a for like a bunch of miles and um, from like city to city and right. then uh they were like hungry and now i think of him and he lives on a really nice home in saint genevieve and uh he has a bunch of property and um it just makes me think of how things can change absolutely josie that's like a perfect example like just because that's where you started or where you grew up, that doesn't define who you are going to be or who you have to be. Um, you you control what you become. Um, all right, Max. Because like, even if you're a kid, uh, like I started rough when I was younger, but I've changed a lot. Yeah. It's like, even like in Maggie's 10, 11 years of life, she's come a long way, right? Like. If you know Maggie, Maggie's pretty open about telling her story and she'll share with you if you ask. But her life didn't wasn't always easy. For a kid, she kind of had it rough. Um, but she's overcome a lot. Like if you just met Maggie, you would never know that she had a I rough childhood Maggie. like she did. So um, yeah, Zeke. So Dwayne Wade, he's a famous basketball player. <laughs> And this was, like, it's not going to happen every day, but he grew up in, like, the hood in Oakland, and now he's a famous basketball player. And he, like... Yeah. So, yeah. Like exactly. Like, where you start oh. isn't where you finish. Exactly. Okay. So, here's where we're going to start. We're going to start on chapter one. You don't have to work on that, love muffin. Uh, all right. So... Actually, there we go. Okay, chapter one. When I left my office that beautiful spring day, I had no idea what was in store for me. To begin with, everything was too perfect for anything unusual to happen. It was one of those days where a man feels good, feels like speaking to his neighbor, is glad to live in a country like ours, and proud of his government. You know what I mean? One of those rare days when everything is right and nothing is wrong. I was walking along whistling when I heard the dog fight. At first, I paid no attention to it. After all, it wasn't anything to get excited about. Just another dog fight in a residential section. Residential is like a subdivision, right? Like where houses are, where people live. Okay. As the sound of the fight grew nearer, I could tell there were quite a few dogs mixed up in it. They boiled out of an alley, turned, and headed straight toward me. Not wanting to get bitten or run over, I moved over to the edge of the sidewalk. I could see that all the dogs were fighting one. About 25 feet from me, they caught him, and down he went. I felt sorry for the unfortunate one. I knew if something wasn't done quickly, the sanitation department was going to have to pick up a dead dog. Is the sanitation department still Like the trash department. Like pick up the yeah, pick up roadkill and all of that kind of stuff. I was trying to make up my mind to help when I got a surprise. Up out of that snarling, growling, slashing mess reared up an old red bone hound. 
For a second, I saw him. I, it caught my breath. I couldn't believe what I'd seen. Twisting and slashing, he fought his way through the pack and backed up under the low branches of a hedge. Growling and snarling, they formed a half-moon circle around him. A big bird dog, bolder than the others, darted in. The head shook as he tangled with the hound. He came out so fast he fell over backwards. I saw that his right ear was split wide open. It was too much for him, and he took off down the street, squalling like a scalded cat. A big, ugly cur tried his luck. He didn't get off so easy. He came out with his left shoulder laid open to the bone. He sat down on his rear and let the world know that he'd been hurt. By this time, my fighting blood was boiling. It's hard for a man to stand and watch an old hound fight against such odds, especially if that man has memories in his heart like I had in mine. I had seen the time when an old hound like that had given his life so that I might live. Taking off my coat, I waded in. My yelling and scolding didn't have much effect, but the swinging coat did. The dogs scattered and left. Down on my knees, I peered back under the hedge. The hound was still mad. He growled at me and showed his teeth. I knew it wasn't his nature to fight a man. In a soft voice, I started talking to him. Come on, boy, I said. It's all right. I'm your friend. Come on now. The fighting fire slowly left his eyes. He bowed his head and his long red tail started thumping the ground. I kept coaxing and on his stomach an inch at a time, he came to me and laid his head in my hand. Aww. I almost cried at what I saw. His coat was dirty and mud caked. His skin was stretched drum tight over his bony frame. The knotty joints of his hips and shoulders stood out a good three inches from his body. I could tell he was starved. I couldn't figure it out. He didn't belong in town. He was far out of place with the boxers, poodles, bird dogs, and other breeds of town dogs. He belonged in the country. He was a hunting hound. I raised one of his paws, and there I read the story. The pads were worn down slick as the rind of an apple. I knew he had come a long way and no doubt had a long way to go. Around his neck was a crude collar. On closer inspection, I saw it had been made from a piece of check line leather. Two holes had been punched in each end, and the ends were laced together with baling wire. As I turned the collar with my finger, I saw something else. There, scratched deep in the tough leather, was the name Buddy. I guessed that the crude scribbly letters had probably been written by a little boy. It's strange indeed how memories can lie dormant in a man's mind for so many years. Yet those memories can be awakened and brought forth fresh and new just by something you've seen or something you've heard or the sight of an old familiar face. What I saw in the warm gray eyes of the friendly old hound brought back wonderful memories. To show my gratitude, I took hold of his collar and said, come on boy, let's go home and get something to eat. He seemed to understand that he'd found a friend and he came willingly. I'm gonna pause there. So it seems like this man that's rescuing the dog has a lot of memories. What do you think that he's maybe thinking about? He, the exact same dog. he had the exact same kind of dog when he was a kid, you think? It is his dog. And what? It, it could be his old dog. No, that ran it could away. be his old dog that ran away. No. It, said, he, it well, said he sacrificed it while he gave his life to dogs. Okay. Jason remembered that it said that once he had a dog that gave his life for him. Okay, and Grayson said that. Um, Fiona. I'm thinking maybe when he said the dog gave his life for him, maybe his parents kind of had to choose because they both loved him and the dog at the same time. So the dog decided to like run away so it was a boy could have a happy home. Okay. And uh, maybe now that he actually found the dog, maybe that's his dog from a long time ago. Okay, maybe it's his dog from a long time ago. But does everybody kind of agree he probably had a dog that was like this one? Probably. At some point, yeah. probably. Okay. I gave him a bath and rubbed all the soreness from his muscles. He drank quarts of warm milk and ate all the meat I had in the house. I hurried down to the store and bought more. He ate until he was satisfied. He slept all that night and most of the next day. Late in the afternoon, he grew restless. I told him I understood, and as soon as it was dark, he could be on his way. I figured he had a much better chance if he left town at night. That evening, a little after sundown, I opened the back gate. He walked out, stopped, turned around, and looked at me. He thanked me by wagging his tail. With tears in my eyes, I said, you're more than welcome, old fella. In fact, you could have stayed here as long as you wanted to. He whined and licked my hand. I was wondering which way he would go. 
With one final whimper, he turned and headed east. I couldn't help smiling as I watched him trot down the alley. I noticed the way his hindquarters shifted over to the right, never in line with the front, yet always in perfect rhythm. His long ears flopped up and down, keeping time with the jogging motion of his body. Yes, they were all there, the unmistakable marks of a hunting hound. Where the alley emptied into the street, he stopped and looked back. I waved my hand. As I watched him disappear in the twilight shadows, I whispered these words. Goodbye, old fella. Good luck and good hunting. I didn't have to let him go. I could have kept him in my backyard. But to pin up a dog like that is a sin. It would have broken his heart. The will to live would have slowly left his body. I had no idea where he'd come from or where he was going. Perhaps it wasn't too far. Or maybe it was a long, long way. I tried to make myself believe that his home was in the Ozark Mountains somewhere in Missouri or Oklahoma. It wasn't possible, even though it was a long way from the Snake River Valley in Idaho. I figured something drastic must have happened in his life, as it's very unusual for a hound to be traveling all alone. Perhaps he'd been stolen or maybe he'd been sold for some much-needed money. Whatever it was that had interrupted his life, he was trying to straighten it out. He was going home to the master he loved, and with the help of God, he'd make it. To him, it made no difference how long the road or how rough and rocky. His old red feet would keep jogging along on and on, mile after mile. There'd be no crying or giving up. When his feet grew tired and weary, he would curl up in the weeds and rest. You know? Yes, ma'am? Sure. Maggie to the office. Oh, All right. Um, okay. Water from a rain puddle or a mountain stream would quench his thirst and cool his hot, dry throat. Food found along the highway or the offerings from a friendly hand would ease the pangs of hunger. Through the rains, the snows, or the desert heat, he would jog along, never looking back. Some morning, he would be found curled up on the front porch. The long journey would be over. He would be home. There would be a lot of tail wagging and a few whimpering cries. His warm, moist tongue would caress the hand of his master, and all would be forgiven. Once again, the lights would shine in the dog's world. His heart would be happy. After my friend had disappeared in the darkness, I stood and stared at the empty alley. A strange feeling came over me, and at first I thought I was lonely or sad, but I realized that wasn't it at all. The feeling was a wonderful one. Although the old hound had no way of knowing it, he had stirred memories, and what priceless treasures they were. Memories of my boyhood days, an old Casey baking powder can, and two little red hounds. Memories of a wonderful love, unselfish devotion, and death in its saddest form. As I turned to enter my yard, I started to lock the gate. And then I thought, no, I'll leave it open. He might come back. I was about halfway to the house when a cool breeze drifted down from the rugged Tetons. Those are um, mountains that are nearby. It had a bite in it and a goose pimple jumped out on my skin. I stopped at the woodshed and picked up several sticks of wood. I didn't turn on any lights on entering the house. The dark, quiet atmosphere was a perfect setting for the mood I was in. I built a fire in the fireplace and pulled up my favorite rocker. And as I sat there in silence, the fire grew larger. It crackled and popped. Firelight shadows began to shimmer and dance around the room. The warm, comfortable heat felt good. I struck a match to light my pipe. And as I did, two beautiful cups gleamed from the mantle. I held the match up so I could get a better look. There they were, sitting side by side. One was large with long, upright handles that stood out like wings on a morning dove. The highly polished surface gleamed and glistened with a golden sheen. The other was a smaller and made of silver. It was neat and trim and sparkled like a white star in the heavens. I got up and took them down. There was a story in those cups, a story that went back more than half century. As I caressed the smooth surfaces, my mind drifted back through the years, back to my boyhood days. How wonderful the memories were. Piece by piece, the story unfolded. All right, we're going to stop right here. But I want to go back. Number one, does anybody know? It says the story goes back more than a half century. How long is a half century? How long is a century? 100 years. 100 years. So a half century would be 50 years. 50 years. 50 years. 50 years. 50 years. So then if the story of his boyhood days goes back more than a half century, the guy that's telling the story so far, he has to be at least 60. 
50 something years old, maybe even pushing 60 something, because if he was a boy a when this boy. happened, and that was 50 years ago, he's probably about 60 something he now. Okay, good. Um, what do you think these cups are? Are they just like a regular, like, cup that you drink out of it? I said one of them had like fancy handles on it. Just like wooden cups. You think they're wooden? No, it said they were silver or polished or something. Right, what do you think? So they might represent like his dog that he had in the past because it said like that he had two oh, little yeah. hounds. Okay, it said he had two old hounds and it says there's two cups. So Rye thinks that in some way they're connected to the two dogs. Zeke, what are you thinking? So weird to not have you in here just like yeah. talking all the time. Well, I think they like, well, are like, like really special. Like, Maybe they're special. Maybe they're special. Maybe they're special. Maybe they're special. Okay. Joey, it's what echoing. What did he say? What did he say? Repeat the last part of what you said, Zeke. It was a little echoey. I don't know why, but I don't know um, why, but um, like it was like it was um, like um, I still have no idea what you said. It got it like it. it you, I heard you say, "I don't know why," and then it got really echoey again. Maybe you should mute really quick. I'll mute and see if that fixes you, Zeke. So, um, maybe he used them as the bulls for his two hounds that he used to have. Is it still echoing? Makes sense. All right. Cam, what are you thinking? I see your hand raised. What do you think the cups represent? I think the cups are, they bring back memories for him because I think that back in the day, they used whatever they could for their dogs. So I think that those cups were like their watering bowls or their food bowls and his dog's bowls. And then that's why they bring back memories for him. Okay. Possibly. I like these thoughts. Fiona, what are your thoughts? My thought is that maybe, like, kind of connected to the birdies. Like, maybe, like, you know how dogs are, like, dreaming or something? So, like, people can keep their ashes or do something with their ashes. Mm -hmm. um, oh, so, like, where they put their ashes in? Maybe it was, like, one of those. If maybe, like, um, their dog is still in there. So, two of them. Maybe those are their dogs. Okay. Like, yeah, because that is true. Sometimes when people have their family members or their pets cremated they put them in like little fancy cups or vases or whatever and they put them on like their mantle or a shelf or somewhere um that that does happen um sophie what are your thoughts so whenever he had to like let the dog go whenever i was answering his question i remember that whenever i was like maybe a month old i had to let go of one of my one, what my first dog hmm. that is I sad i remember when you were a month old yeah month old. okay I have all right this that, that sean so maybe uh, I like, think the cruise Indians were like I think maybe all those marks on the cup like more like stuff like on the cruise she had a peanut toe and like the girl with the red hair had a peanut toe oh. and her dad didn't know about it. Okay, so I'm gonna stick with the book because I don't know what you're talking about right now. Um, okay. Question one on our worksheet, and we're going to talk through these together. Um, why, according to the man that's telling the story so far, our narrator, why was it a rare day? It was nice. It was when a, everything it was a nice day. Was when everything say, is right and nothing was wrong. Everything, was everything is right. Good and nothing bad day. Yeah, and everything good, nothing bad day. Um, when everything yeah. is right and nothing is wrong. That's exactly what it says. Describe the scene with the dog fight. Um, How did you picture that in your head? Oh, I thought it was a canine. I kind of pictured like um, dogs like in an alley. Yeah. Kind of. And like these two really big, mean kind of dogs. Saw this one dog and how they were kind of like threatening them. So 
they went over and started attacking them. Okay, so bigger mean dogs were attacking this one dog. It says it started in an alley and it spilled out of the alley, coming down the sidewalk. Sophie, then what? Well, for some reason, I pictured like a black and brown dog having a big fight and they're both pit bulls. Because of the cover. Okay, Sophie was picturing was, pit bulls just because fish. they get a bad reputation but, for being kind of um, meanies. I was finished. Not every pit bull's like I that. Wasn't well, pit bulls are sweet. Okay. Yeah, I wasn't finished. Oh, sorry. If you, if you, if you, but, and, hang on, Sophie's still talking, guys. For another reason, I had I pictured that the brown dog was like the was the one that was being fought, and they were in a, they were by a fence. And the brown dog's up against the fence. He didn't know where else to go. Okay. Yeah, it did say that they kind of cornered the one and he kind of backed into a bush. And okay. then the other Sam, one. Sam, what else? Why are you going to have on the Okay. Sam said it made him think about Michael Vick. Who is Michael Vick? A football player. Does he fight a lot? No, he got in trouble for dog fighting. He got in trouble for dog fighting. Okay. So this isn't like a structured dog fight. This is like actual dogs actually fighting. And um, Josie, what are you picturing? Well, it's, um, I agree with like somewhat of what everyone said, but then something that also came to my mind, just like knowing the behavior of dogs, I can guess that like they were jumping all over him and stuff like like how dogs do, I guess, but like more aggressively. Yeah, so like in my mind, Joe's agree. Like I'm picturing this one dog, the red bone coon hound is what they called him. He's backed into a corner, but I, I'm picturing these other dogs like pouncing at him and clawing at him and biting at him and just constantly like, I'm totally just hopping like a dork. Um, yeah. This is what I'm doing right now. Um, yeah, I, I, feel like I'm picturing the dogs like constantly like pouncing on him um, and biting and scratching at him every time they and come down on him and he's and he's trying to like retreat and back away. Um, but then it said one at a time, the dogs kind of went in the bush after him. And when they went in one at a time after him, what did the Red Bull Coon Hound do then, Zeke? Um, so how I pictured it was like the... So there was like um at the beginning before the <clears throat> the red coon hound came, the one dog was like bigger that they were all fighting, and there were like smaller dogs like chasing him. And the coon hound came and he was like up against the hedge in front of like a fenced house, and then like the okay. dog was just like coming at him, and then he just like got out somehow. Yeah, I. Jason, yes, sir. How I pictured it was like, so he, there, kind of like what Zeke said, there was one, the one that they were like attacking was bigger than them, but there was so many of the littler, littler ones that it didn't seem like a fight, that he, the bigger one that w would win. But then the uh, hunting hound, I think it was, came in. Then when there was two big dogs, the other ones scattered out and scrammed. Yeah. Okay. All right. Now, why does this man telling the story believe that this dog belongs in the country? Sean, why does he think that this dog belongs in the country? Yes, you may go to the bathroom. Uh, Zeke, why does he believe he belongs in the country? Well, I noticed that so my grandma and grandpa live in the country and they have a dog and he talked about their rough paw pads. And so they have a beagle and his paw pads are really rough since he's always out on the farm and hunting and stuff. And then another thing is that usually hounds or hounds like that breed of dog are um, not city dogs. Like they're hunting dogs usually because they have really good noses. Yes. Okay. Good. Agree. Uh, Josie. Well, um, one, they uh, described the um, filling of uh, the pads on his paws. And then also, 
um, the guy in it described uh, the different dogs that he did see around. I mean, you could always have that kind of dog, but it's like he described kind of in my mind that it was unusual to have a dog like that where he was at. Okay. Yeah. He listed a couple of kind of dogs that seemed like more like that would be a pet dog. Like I think he listed a poodle. Sam knows all about the poodles. I know. Um, uh, and, and yeah, I, you definitely wouldn't see a poodle out in the woods hunting in, in the wilderness. Cam, would what would would your poodle survive if they just like got out and got lost in the forest? Yes. You think they would? Yes, because in Germany they originally bred for hunting. So really? Yeah. Yes. I did not know that about poodles. All right, Miss Bab just got schooled. It's all right. That happens. I'm. I don't know everything. Um. Uh. 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 But when I picture like a modern poodle. And like, you know how they're pictured in like cartoons and stuff where they're like manicured with the poofy butt and the poofy tail (laughs) and the poofy ears and how they look in cartoons. That dog's like a prissy dog that isn't going to survive nowhere. um, Lady and the Tramp. Like Lady and the Tramp type poodle type, right? Like that's a prissy dog that's all fancy. Right, fancy. Um, But Josie's right. He listed a couple of breeds that said, this is the kind of dog you see in our town. That coon hound, he didn't match those others. The other thing he said was that he, how did his body look? The red bone coon hound, what did his body look like? There was some bone showing, uh, skin was stretched. His skin was stretched so tight because he was starved. He was all dirty. Filthy. Sophie. But one of them's ears was torn wide open, yep. Uh, That was one of the ones that was fighting, though, not the coon hound didn't get torn open, I don't think. Um, but yeah, he was filthy. He was starving. So he clearly wasn't anybody's pet looking like that. He was, he was a long way from home. Um, okay. So how did the man help the dog? What did he do that helped the dog? Gave him a lot of food. Okay. What else, Fiona? Meat and milk. What else did he give him? Josie. Um, he, uh, helped me take the dogs away. Okay, he helped to get the dogs away so that he could be safe and leave that area. Um, Riley, what else? Did the man give the dog a bath? He gave him a bath. He, he fed him and bathed him. Fed him, bathed him, gave him milk to drink, saved him from the dogs, and gave him a safe place to rest. Okay. Because it said he slept for like a day and a half. But do we know? Did the man like save the dog? Because the dog leaves. Right. Well, so isn't the dog just going to eventually be right back where he just started like starving and dirty? Bad. And It did say that he was super skinny because he was super hungry. So then he fed him because he could. the dog could have died of uh, starvation. Could have died of starvation, but yes. He helped. So why do you think the dog left and he didn't stay? Because the dog knows this guy's going to feed him and give him what he needs to be healthy. So why didn't the dog stay? Grace, why didn't the dog stay? Because he knows someone someone loves him and that they want him. So okay. He, he knows that his, yeah, he's got a home and this guy isn't his home, right? So he wants to get back to who his real home Wait, is. Doesn't okay. the callers usually... Doesn't the caller usually have like a phone number you call? So nowadays, if you have a dog that's outside, they're supposed to have a collar on. It's it's called a leash law. And they're supposed to have some sort of like identifying information or like a microchip in them. However, this story is not written now. Um, I want to say that. And it said the kid, it looked like the kid wrote his name. It looked like a kid had scratched the name, the dog's name in the collar, but that was all it was. Hang on, I'm looking at copyright. Maybe when he said it helped with his life, maybe he was a home, and they were like, people that were looking after him, they were trying to hurt him, but then the dog, like, 
Maybe. Okay. This book was written in the early 60s. So they didn't have like chips. So they didn't have microchips back then and they didn't have like the little collar tags that were like laser cut with your name and address and everything. Um, so they didn't have that kind of thing back then. So now think about this. If it was 1960 something when this book was written and we think that the man is about 60 years old, that means that he was born somewhere around the turn of the century, like 1900. Okay, so 1900 is a is when he was a little boy with the dogs. Okay, in the early 1900s is when he was probably a little boy with the dogs. Okay, so at this point he probably wouldn't be alive. At this point, he would be over well over 100 years old. Um, but at this point, he's about a 60-year-old person. And he just helped a dog. And it brought back memories of when he had two dogs. Um, but we don't know much else about that. Okay? Three vocabulary words. The first one is scalded. It said, one of the dogs ran away squealing like a scalded cat. What does scalded mean? Sam's guessing scared. No. Gray. Now being yelled at viciously, basically. Being yelled at viciously? Fiona. Whimpering wild dog. Whimpering wild. Nope, 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 nope. All right. If you have your Chromebook out, Google scald. Zeke. Zeke's wearing even his hand. He knows. Zeke. Um, it's like threatened and like beaten up and like, yeah, like threatened basically. Josie. It's like, no, no. And then you got scolded. You don't even know what it's called. All right. To be scalded is burned by a very hot liquid. So if you burn, if you accidentally spilled boiling water on yourself, that is being scalded. So if you poured boiling water on a cat, imagine how it would scream and squeal and the noise it would make. Okay. So yes, to scald is to injure with very hot liquid or steam. You can, yes, you can be scalded by steam too. So like if your mom is boiling water on the stove or whatever, and you know that there's always like steam rising from the pot or whatever, she's about to make some spaghetti, she's about to throw some pasta in. Water's exactly. boiling, there's a lot of steam. If you just hold your hand over the steam, could you hold your hand there over the steam for very long at all? Yeah. Then no. Please don't. Why? You will get I scalded. You can get burned by It, you can it, really your hand wet. Yeah. it will make yeah. your hand wet, but if you hold it there long enough, if the steam is hot enough, it could burn you. Uh, yeah. The steam from boiling water might not be hot enough to burn you, but other types of steam could be. Riley has a story to tell. Yes, it's kind of funny, kind of sad. So I was younger. <laughs> I was younger, and my mom had her straightener plugged in. Oh, no. I touched the straightener. <laughs> Okay, would touching your mom's curling iron or straightener be a skull? Yes. It's, it's what? It's not a liquid. No, it's not a liquid. It's it would be a bad burn. And that happened to Landon once, too. I was curling my hair, and I dropped my curling iron, and he grabbed it off the He was a little bitty, like three. Didn't know any better. And he just, like, straight picked it up by the hot parts. Like, his hand was, like, destroyed for, like, a while. Um, and he cried and cried and cried. I had to call in. Because, yeah, he was hurt bad. Yeah. Um, but, no, that would not be a scald. That would just be a burn. A scald is when you are burned by liquid. Hot glue does not count. Okay. All right, Sophie, yes. I don't know whether once to buy the stove. I think my mom was making, like, mac and cheese and some kind of noodles. Mm -hmm. And she was pouring grease on the pan. And it, like, bubbled up. And, no, my little brother, like, like the... Handle right here was like that. He did that, and it went all over his hand, and he had like two, two huge bruises. That were like yeah, hot. blisters. Yeah, um, grease will burn you really bad too. Hot grease. Okay. Oh, um, the brain. next vocabulary word is curve. C U R. To comb your hair. 
curve. If that one, it called one of the dogs, I think. The it old cur ran like away. Maybe yeah, it said really the old cur tried its luck at attacking. Hang on, maybe it's like a really like, Um, Everybody's got a lot. Of, there's about four or five different versions of this book. So for me to give out a page number isn't going to yeah. work because there's everybody's got different versions. Um, we'll say it from your book. And on mine. The big ugly cur tried his luck on mine. It's about halfway down page two. Says a big ugly cur tried his luck. What do you think a cur is? Oh, I call hag. An old hag. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Sophie. What do you think, cur? From what I was looking at, it said a poor aggressive dog. A poor aggressive dog. Sophie is. No, I'm wrong. How crude. Cur, an aggressive dog that is in poor condition. Oh, but it's so cute. A mongrel. Miss Rabbit. A mutt, basically like a mutt dog that is also mean. A mean mutt dog. Wait, my grandma oh, was kind of dog. She's real nice. It's from the old Norse word meaning to grumble or growl. All right. And our final vocab word, crude. Crude. I don't remember exactly where that was, but what does crude mean? Crude. C-R-U-D-E. Like crude. Josie, what do you think crude means? I don't really know exactly, but um, the first thing that came to my mind was something like um, it was like a crude situation, like something bad had happened. I don't really know, though. Okay. You have the same version I do. Is that what it is? Oh, a crude collar. It's on three-fourths of the way down page three in my oh, book. maybe ugly? What book do you have? Crude. Um, Sean says maybe it means ugly. Um, around his neck was a crude collar. And then yeah, it gives a description. Are... Okay, Macy, what do you think? A spiked collar? A spiked collar? Oh, well, a worn, Sean says worn out. Old and worn. Tattered. Old and worn. Okay, it says it was made from leather. Two holes had been punched in each end, and they were laced together with wire. And then it has the name scratched in it. So if you're picturing that collar, does it seem like a, does it seem like a really fancy collar that he went to get off of a from a nice pet store? No, it's just like a collar that like a belt. Kind of like a belt, Grayson said. And I kind of picture that. that was old used collar. That was that An old used collar. Okay. All right, so let's look up crude and see. Um, in a natural or raw state, not yet processed or refined. So crude means, yeah, constructed in a rudimentary or like a beginner way, in a makeshift kind of way. So you kind of just like threw something together. Dang it. So you didn't do your best. You just like threw it together. So like they didn't go to any trouble to make that collar. They kind of just used whatever they had around the house and threw something together. They didn't put any time in it. Ooh. They didn't put any time or effort. It was just kind of thrown together. Okay. Crude is kind of, um, yeah, it's it's kind of in a thrown together kind of a way. Yeah. Okay. Miss Mab, look up hunting uh, hound. I want to see what they look like. Hunting hound. Oh, the red bone coon hound. Sure thing. Like because we're going to talk about the red bone coon hound. Doesn't look like a beagle at all. Hang on, I'll share it with everybody once it comes up. It's not. Oh, I think it's the other dog. Redbone Coonhound. Share my screen. Redbone Coonhound. They are cute. They look like this. I don't look like my dog. I have a dog that looks like that. Uh, so wait, right from, from uh, look at yeah. that sweet little puppy face. <gasps> Miss Bab, Miss Bab, Miss Bab, Miss Bab. All right, put this one right beside it. This that, one? Yeah. Yeah, that one just that one looks old. <laughs> All right, so <laughs> that's what's cute about it. That is the dog that. He rescued, that he cleaned up and fed. Um, now, 
for the rest of the time. Um, yeah, Cam. Okay, so on our worksheet at the very beginning, it says, um, the very first page in ours, it says, autobiographical fiction before the story things you know a lot about and then over on the side says things about you and then on the second yeah. page on the very bottom of the vocabulary it says enrichment why write a short biography of the author wilson rolls you're about three seconds ahead of me love muffin that was exactly what i was about to talk about um we are not going to do the short biography of wilson rolls today because we don't have time what I do want you guys to do is the part at the top that says things you know a lot about and things about you. So if you were going to be writing an autobiographical fiction story about yourself, if you're not, but list three things that you know a lot about. What are three things you know a lot about that you could maybe put in your story if you were going to write about? And then three things about you that you would want to include in your story. Maybe are you an animal lover like this guy? I'm definitely an animal. Did you grow up in a poor home like this guy? Is that something that you would want to mention? So tell me three things you know a lot about and three things about you. So I do want you to fill out that part today. Um, but where you mentioned Cam, the enrichment part, write a short biography of the author, Wilson Rawls. We will eventually do that, but not today. Okay. So no worries on that one, but do write the few little things about yourself. Um, and that's what we've got for today, the readings. So I'm going to hit stop on record for now. Um, give you guys a few minutes to work on that. And yes, Josie. So do we just send it all in blank, but that one part? Yes. Yeah, you can. Um, since we talked about all the other questions together, you can leave it all blank except for that one part. And then just fill out the top section and then that's it. All right. 